weekday at nine, only on Dave. Or watch it now with UK TV Play. Yesterday takes you on a tour of London's dark side as we follow the streets that map out the locations of the city's most infamous murders. You take them up one by one to the basement, hit them on the back of the head and uh, dissolve the bodies in acid. Thousands of people signed a petition begging for Ruth Ellis to be reprieved. It seemed at one stage as though there were an awful lot of trunks with dead bodies inside them. Discover the ominous past of our capital city. The UK premiere of the new series of Murder Maps starts Thursday at 9 on Yesterday or watch it now with UK TV Play. Now on Yesterday, we begin a comprehensive chronicle of the First World War unfolding on a barely imaginable scale. Discover the Great War in numbers. A new kind of world, and a new kind of war. A war of numbers. Ammunition, guns, ships, aircraft, men who will die in their millions. A war fought by calculating generals for whom no cost is too high. The First World War is fought on a scale never before seen in the whole of human history. A billion artillery shells, a million machine guns, 50 billion bullets. 65 million men at war who die at a rate of 6,000 a day. Men are reduced to numbers. Of all the men in Europe aged from 19 to 22 at the start of the war, a third will be dead by the end. No family will be left unscathed. The First World War changes the course of human history. Out of it comes communism and fascism. Out of it comes votes for every citizen, the foundation of modern democracy. It is a war between empires that destroys empires. It is a war in which the old rulers pay scant regard for the lives of ordinary people. And for this callous indifference, the old ruling class will pay the price. But how and why did it happen? August 1914. Across Europe, men have been called up to fight. The numbers already unprecedented in military history. It comes to a staggering 18 million. No one really saw this coming. Europe had been at peace for over 40 years. In the decades since the last European war, the continent has changed. Industrialization has introduced mass production. The machine age is changing society. And now it is about to transform the nature of human conflict. They had never seen industrialized warfare on this scale. Most previous European wars had been small affairs by comparison. But in the 19th century, industrial progress brings greater wealth and health. The population expands rapidly, especially in Germany, where it grows to a rate of almost one million a year, to over 67 million. The masses are seen by Europe's ruling classes as subjects, there to be governed, and when required, to fight. To understand the origins of the First World War, we must examine Europe's old ruling class and the empires which they aspired to build and govern. In 1914, the British possessed the largest empire the world has ever seen. It covers 12.7 million square miles. Britain governs a quarter of the world's population. Second in size is the Russian Empire of Tsar Nicholas II. Third largest and Britain's rival in Africa is France. Germany's tiny empire is just a tenth the size of Britain's. 
Today, the whole idea of empire seems very anachronistic and very old-fashioned. But, of course, back then it was incredibly important, especially for the ruling classes. Why? Because it gives them the ability to control a market in the way that you simply can't control a market today. The British Empire is unusual. Britain has a large and influential merchant class, which has pioneered the idea of open free trade. British exports are worth over 500 million pounds. A quarter of all manufactured goods come from Britain. But most rulers see their empires as instruments of trade restriction and control. A bigger empire means more prestige and greater wealth at the expense of their rivals. For Germany, the small size of their empire is not just a matter of bruised pride. It is an obstacle to economic expansion. In the decades before 1914, Germany was going through her own industrial revolution, in some areas even overtaking Britain. The German industry and the German economy had been going through a boom period since the turn of the century. Electrical goods and chemical goods were the two leading sectors. In fact, only three German chemical companies dominated 90% of the world market by 1914. German steel production increases a thousand percent to almost 19 million tons, more than Britain, France and Russia combined. German companies are the world's main source of industrial chemicals, pharmaceuticals and dyes. Even the khaki dye for the British uniforms came from Germany. By the start of 1914, German industry is big, dynamic, but frustrated. It craves even greater access to world markets to buy raw materials and to sell its finished products. Yet large areas of the world are under the control of foreign powers. The German ruling elite were extraordinarily concerned that if they didn't catch up with the likes of Britain, France, the United States, and indeed even Russia, they would be left behind, they'd be deprived of the world's resources, gradually strangled. The German elites were convinced that they had legitimate right, given the economic power that Germany had at the time, that this should also translate into a presence on the international stage. But it's not just about cornering markets. Germany is still dominated by a noble officer caste, full-time soldiers who yearn both for the thrill and adventure of war, as well as the well-paid, prestigious colonial jobs that come with running a large empire. To build that empire, the Germans know they'll need a powerful navy. The job of building it falls to Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz. Tirpitz realized that if you could create a large navy, it would allow you to project power and suck in commerce from around the world, expel investments, bring in raw materials, and assure Germany's future. German naval spending triples, from eight million pounds a year to 23 million. But Britain responds to Germany's naval ambitions by building even more ships. It decides to double the size of the Royal Navy, devoting to it no less than a quarter of all public spending, over 45 million pounds. Britain has more ships and bigger ships. In 1906, she launches the most powerful battleship the world has ever seen, HMS Dreadnought. The Dreadnought is in a league of its own. Each of her 10, 12-inch guns fires a half-ton shell. A single broadside can sink any opponent. By 1914, Britain has 22 giant dreadnoughts in service, 13 more under construction, and 574 other ships and submarines. 609 warships in total. 
The strongest navy in the world today is the United States Navy, which has roughly 450 ships. So that gives you a sense of just how dominant the Royal Navy was in 1914. It is and will remain one of the biggest navies in history. Germany can only muster 15 big battleships and 319 other vessels. All other navies in the world lag far behind. Germany's expanding navy, large standing army, and aggressive foreign policy fails to grow her empire. But it succeeds in worrying her imperial rivals, Britain, France, and Russia. The German Weltpolitik, or world policy as it's called, had had very little success. By 1913, not only have they got domestic problems, which are causing the ruling elite some kind of anxiety, but on the international stage, they have effectively managed to alienate Britain. They've certainly alienated France, an old rival and adversary, and they've pushed together France and Russia, two countries with entirely different political systems, but united only by a common concern about Germany. It had been a complete shambles because it turned out that German military might did not translate into actual gain and that all it produced, the pursuit of world politics, was increasing frictions and tensions in the international system. Before the outbreak of war, continental Europe is fraught with tension. Its great imperial powers are jostling for position against one another, while attempting to suppress the aspirations and rebelliousness of their own subjects. Many members of Europe's aristocratic officer class are spoiling for a war. Unfortunately for them, and everyone else in Europe, they are about to get one. So, what do you think? <gasps> it's so high. Ah. Ooh. So low. So. No. Oh. <sighs> so, so windy. windy. <laughs> so, let's celebrate. Oh. With the most <laughs> rental options, you'll find you're happy at Right Move. At Christmas, we extend our hospitality to everyone. And sometimes, we need to extend it even more. <laughs> Order now for guaranteed Christmas delivery. Save over £500 on this solid hardwood St Ives dining set. And this 100% solid oak Dorset dining set is now only 8 99 Any room for dinner? <laughs> Come on, then. It isn't Christmas dinner without Oak Furniture Land. Order today for guaranteed Christmas delivery. Do you love a Readly good read? Enjoy magazines? Then download Readly and try it free. With over 1,500 magazines for £7.99 a month, have your favourite magazines on your screens. Anywhere, anytime, anyone. Readly for everyone. Use Readly across five devices, share it, or keep it to yourself. Online, offline, or you can read for £7.99 a month. Read the Readly way. Try it free. Transform your home with our autumn deals at AO.com. Breathe new life into your kitchen and save up to £250 in our built-in sale. Save £60 on this super energy-efficient hot-point washing machine, now only £239. And curl up in front of a movie with this 50-inch smart 4K Ultra HD Hisense TV, now only £449. Order today, deliver tomorrow. Hey, oh, let's go! Say goodbye to the same old faces to the same grey skies and the same cramped spaces. Say hello to a world full of differences. Differences that expand and enrich us. Because after all, our lives aren't made better when we close ourselves off to the world. They are made better when we open ourselves up to it. Celebrity Cruises. We're looking into disappearances. He calls himself the snowman killer. I think he's going after women that he disapproves of. And I received this. He's playing games with us. 
who does he leave the snowman for? Hello? My shoulder gel active insoles completely change the way it feels to walk. Even when I'm on my feet all day long, it still feels like I'm walking on a gel cloud. From the Shoalfoot experts, gel active insoles with three components for double the comfort. I love it when the last step of the day feels as good as the first. Gel active insoles from Shoal. PPI deadline. Make a decision. Do it now! Shh! No, you shush. Click the link that says the Financial Conduct Authority. I also need your glasses. The Financial Conduct Authority has everything you need to know about PPI. Visit fca.org.uk forward slash PPI or call 0800 101 8800. With Expedia, when you book your flights and hotel together, you can often save money. I've got the whole world in my hand. Atoll Protected. The German army was undoubtedly the greatest army in Europe in 1914. A massive displacement of people caused absolute terror. This kind of warfare is a descent into inhumanity that the world hasn't seen before. The unprecedented numbers behind one catastrophic war. People were struggling to survive. The UK premiere of The Great War in Numbers continues Wednesday at 9 on Yesterday or catch up with UK TV Play. By the summer of 1914, Germany is surrounded by enemies. Her only friends among the imperial powers lie to the south. Germany has formed an alliance with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which for the last 60 years has been ruled by the Habsburg Emperor Franz Joseph. The empire includes within its borders more than a dozen different nationalities. The most privileged are the Austrians, who rule over the Czechs and Poles in the western half of the empire, and the Hungarians, who rule over a hodgepodge of nationalities in the eastern half. To the south is the recently annexed province of Bosnia-Herzegovina, home to over 800,000 Serbs. This multi-ethnic mix is reflected in the empire's armies. The makeup of the Austro-Hungarian army is quite remarkable. You have Slovaks, Austrians, Hungarians, even Slavs who would probably rather be fighting for the Russians, so it's a really unwieldy machine. To call up soldiers to the Austro-Hungarian Imperial Army, posters have to be put up in 15 languages. Many of these disparate ethnic groups aspire to freedom and independence. Serb nationalists in Bosnia-Herzegovina receive encouragement and weapons from neighbouring Serbia. The aggressive nationalism of the Serbs threatened to undermine the whole stability of the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy. To the rest of Europe, it's a sideshow. The arrogant Habsburgs are having some local trouble controlling their messy empire. But the events that follow will lead to a devastating imperial war, and it starts with just two pistol shots. On the 28th of June, 1914, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, is shot dead whilst visiting the Bosnian capital, Sarajevo. It makes headlines across the world. The assassin belongs to a group backed by neighbouring Serbia. As the Archduke is laid to rest, shock is turning to anger. And that anger is directed at Serbia. The Habsburg Emperor Franz Joseph wants to take action. But he knows that Serbia is friendly with Russia. 
Before he attacks, he wants a guarantee of German support against the big bear on his doorstep. On the 6th of July, he gets it. A telegram from Wilhelm II promises to back Austria whatever they decide. Germany has given Austria a blank check. If there's a war, Germany is ready and eager to fight. Many members of the German elite indeed um, assumed that the crisis could still be contained. And even if it could not be contained, then they were convinced that this was the right moment to strike out. There's some archival evidence to show that the German elite themselves, the very highest people in government, in collusion with the German army, were indeed preparing for some kind of war sometime in the middle of 1914. Austria makes a calculation. If the war can be confined to the Balkans, the numbers are on their side. Serbia, they estimate, can field an army of a quarter of a million men. But Austria-Hungary has an imperial standing army of half a million men, twice as big. And what's more, it has the promised backing of the Kaiser's giant standing army of over 800,000 men. In short, the Habsburgs enjoy overwhelming numerical superiority. So on the 23rd of July, they confidently deliver an ultimatum to the Serbian government, demanding that Austrian officials be allowed to enter Serbia to investigate the assassination. The ultimatum was designed to be completely unacceptable to the Serbs, and indeed it was. In response, the Serbian prime minister appeals to Russia for help. The Russians are fellow Slavs, but more than that, the Tsar is eager to extend his imperial sphere of influence over the Balkans at the expense of Austria-Hungary. Within 48 hours, the Russian Tsar promises to go to any lengths to defend Serbia, adding over a million men to the Serbian side. Russia felt that Germany and Austria were in danger of dominating a region on which Russian commerce would depend in the future. Encouraged by the Tsar's support, Serbia rejects the Habsburg ultimatum on the 25th of July. Now, things escalate. The Russian Empire looks for support from her ally, Imperial France. France has been Germany's enemy since 1871, when the German Empire managed to take control of Alsace and Lorraine. This is France's chance to get them back. So France promises to back Russia with her 850,000 strong regular army. As Europe edges towards war, one country attempts to hold back. Britain is the world's greatest trading nation, and war is ruinous for trade. The initial British cabinet response to any idea of intervention in this continental conflict is one of uh, anathema. They don't want to be involved in this continental war. They've got problems in Ireland, they've had a spate of industrial disputes, which although over, have still left people concerned about Britain's domestic situation. Has an imperial commerce to protect, and war is bad for business as far as the British government are concerned. On the 26th of July, Britain calls for a peace conference. The problem is, is that no one in Europe is really listening anymore. To counter the threat from Russia, the Habsburgs call up vast numbers of reservists, swelling their armies to over three million men. But the Tsar does the same. Russia's army now expands by an incredible five million men. Still, Austria refuses to back down. On the morning of the 28th of July, 1914, Emperor Franz Joseph declares war on Serbia. Instead of holding back, the politicians and generals are rushing headlong towards disaster.
Who's with me? Is that a yes or a no? Yeah. Mega movies, mega weekends. <laughs> this is it, baby, the show. Sony Movie Channel. Available now on Freeview, Sky and Virgin. New lasting finish breathable foundation, ultra light texture and flawless coverage. Live the London look. What if you could book your flight, hotel, activities and car rental all in one place? Expedia are the travel experts who give you the world in your hands. So you can see more of it. Expedia. Everything you need, all in one place. At all protected. At Oak Furniture Land, this stunning original rustic double wardrobe is now just $4.99. Super sale ends Sunday. Order now for guaranteed Christmas delivery. Welcome to QuickBooks. Manage your small business finances with it. Customize and send invoices in seconds. Get paid faster. Automatically calculate self-assessment and VAT. Run payroll with ease. And connect everything to your bank account. All using an effortless solution that's great for accountants and used by over 1 million small businesses. QuickBooks makes any place your place of business. See your finances in a whole new way. Search QuickBooks today. Now with up to 50% off for your first six months. QuickBooks. Your accounts and taxes done. Hello to those of you watching this the other way, enjoying catch up for free with Freeview Play and topping up with some brilliant shows from the likes of Amazon Prime Video or watching the latest movies on Now TV like Rogue One, a Star Wars story. You've got telly watching down to a fine art. The freshness of a toilet can disappear rather quickly. Harpic Fresh Power cleans and delivers a freshness that lasts for up to 500 flushes. Discover Harpic Fresh Power. Dum -dee -dee -dum. We're celebrating being named Rich Insurance Provider of the Year. Join us and get LV's award-winning insurance for your car, home and even your travels. You'll enjoy brilliant customer service, plus you'll get an online discount when you buy direct at LV.com. So why not see how much you could save? Right? One moves, they all move. Guys, can everybody go to the side of the road? Rip the mic! Rip! That's it! Yes, yes! No! Help me out. Come on! What do I have to do? Yeah. The sheep whisperer. Sheep whisperer. Sheep whisperer. There we go! <laughs> you saw that, right? That's a driver win, like saving on car insurance at confused.com. <laughs> Tries a duster. Another one tries a duster. Another one drives a duster. Hey, when do we get one too? Another one drives the a duster. The Dacia Duster range from 9495. And now with the Dacia Scrappage Scheme, you can save up to £1,000 when you swap your old car for a brand new Dacia Duster. You do the maths. Yesterday takes you on a tour of London's dark side as we follow the streets that map out the locations of the city's most infamous murders. He would take them up one by one to the basement, hit them on the back of the head and uh, dissolve the bodies in acid. Thousands of people signed a petition begging for Ruth Ellis to be reprieved. It seemed at one stage as though there were an awful lot of trunks with dead bodies inside them. Discover the ominous past of our capital city. The UK premiere of the new series of Murder Maps starts Thursday at 9 on Yesterday, or watch it now with UK TV Play. In 1914, Europe's imperial powers are summoning vast armies into existence. But how will they move them and supply them? Millions of trained reservists are about to be called up. Ten million men are already armed. 
The horrific scale of World War I, the vast numbers of men killed, none of it would have been possible but for that marvel and symbol of the industrial age, the railway. Railways were absolutely essential. It was only through railways and steam power that these vast armies of hundreds of thousands of soldiers could be brought to the frontiers, supplied, and then carried into battle if necessary. Russia's mobilization relies on her vast rail network. Over 70,000 kilometers of track. Railways are just as important for Germany, with 63,000 kilometers. Austria, Hungary, France, and Britain also have large networks enabling the war to be fought on a colossal scale. You could move a lot more men a lot faster. You could anticipate where they would be at what particular time. You could also move equipment, especially artillery, via rail. Countless Russian trains are rattling towards the German border, carrying hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Just at that moment, Tsar Nicholas receives a telegram from his cousin, Kaiser Wilhelm. Wilhelm promises to stay neutral if Russia will stay out of the fight. The telegram causes the Tsar to hesitate. War, it seems, might be averted. The royal families of Europe were incredibly close. Tsar Nicholas of Russia, King George of Britain, and Kaiser Wilhelm were all first cousins. They called each other Willie, Georgie, and Nicky. They were that close. On the 29th of July, the Tsar refuses to order full mobilization. He wants to stop the trainloads of soldiers heading towards Germany. He is pulling back from the brink of war. But the troops are already on the move. Millions of men are already gathered at train stations. Hundreds of thousands have already set off. The trains cannot simply stop or reverse. Everything was planned out even to the minute, which is why things went wrong. On the 30th of July, the Tsar accepts it's too late to recall his troops. Germany now feels compelled to respond. On the 1st of August, Germany calls up its reservists, another three and a half million men. The German and Austrian armies now number seven and a half million. But France also calls up its three million reserves. The Allied forces number over 10 million. Never in human history have such gigantic armies been marshaled against one another. Austria, Hungary and Germany are outnumbered. To make matters worse for Germany, she faces enemies on two fronts. Russia in the east, France in the west. Britain and Italy are yet to take sides. But numbers will count for less if Germany strikes before her enemies are ready. The Prussian military elite, which is already ready for war, has a plan to win a speedy and stunning victory. The German calculation was that they could indeed beat France in a rapid war. They had undertaken a similar operation against the French in 1870-71, a surprise invasion that had encircled and destroyed the French army. They had some confidence that they could do it again. The plan was drawn up 10 years before by the Prussian nobleman Count Schlieffen, head of the Imperial General Staff. Don't attack the heavily defended French border head on, but send five German armies circling through Belgium. The French army will be focused on the old battlegrounds of Alsace-Lorraine, while huge numbers of Germans pour down into France from the north. Schlieffen's plan was the most ambitious offensive plan ever devised. It was intended to knock France out of the war in just six weeks and allow Germany to transfer almost the entirety of its army to the Eastern Front and deal with Russia in turn. After quickly defeating France, Germany's armies will be sent east to help the Austrians deal with the Russians. The Schlieffen Plan is the first strategic blunder of the Great War. Many more will follow. The Schlieffen Plan was a big gamble and, as one historian has said, basically made no sense. The plan assumes that the French are too few, too feeble, and badly led. 
Ever since the turn of the century, a negative perception of France's capabilities crept into the mindset of German generals and officers. They noticed the demographic decline that France underwent at the time, and they reckoned that France would not be capable of mustering a strong army. The Germans decided that the numbers favored them. Five armies of more than one million men will hit a flank expected to muster little more than half that number of Frenchmen. And if the numbers don't prove overwhelming, the military superiority of Germany's Prussian-dominated army is expected to tip the balance. In terms of organization and equipment, the German army was undoubtedly the greatest army in Europe in 1914. It was heavily armed, it was well organized, it was well trained and it was well prepared. Ready to put the Kaiser's orders into action are the army's 73,000 strong officer corps. German army's officer class was in some ways similar to that of Great Britain. It was fiercely aristocratic, it was proud of its aristocratic traditions, and yet it incorporated an enormous strand of professionalism based on the most demanding officer training of any army in Europe. Below them, 108,000 professional sergeants and corporals and over four million enlisted men. At the beginning of August, Britain is yet to join the war. Newspapers oppose going to war over Serbia, but Britain might go to war to protect Belgium and France. Blinded by its ambition, the German high command dismisses the risks of invading Belgium. It doesn't take the threat of British military intervention seriously. Britain, historically, has had an aversion to large standing armies, a burden on the taxpayer and a threat to freedom. In 1914, despite the size of its empire, Britain can only muster 160,000 men. It's called the British Expeditionary Force and by comparison to the might of the German army, it is tiny. Well, it's alleged that the Germans regarded the British as having a contemptible little army that was so small that, as one Bismarck once said, that if it turned up on the Channel Coast, they'd send a policeman to arrest it. For the Schlieffen plan to work, the vast German armies must move at lightning speed. To do this, the German generals will use industrial methods of mass transport. In 20 days, over 20,000 German trains carry 2 million men, 118,000 horses, and 400,000 tons of supplies to the front. Well, that is astonishing. When you bear in mind they're moving them by steam train, they're moving them hundreds of miles, and the number you're moving is, is equivalent to the population of, uh, of Berlin. It's an extraordinary undertaking. 550 trains a day assemble seven armies. It takes Germany little more than one week to mobilize. It takes France two weeks to gather its armies. Austria-Hungary, four weeks. Russia is expected to take six weeks. On the 4th of August, 1914, Germany invades Belgium, a neutral country Britain now feels compelled to declare war on Germany. Now Britain's transport system swings behind the war effort. In the first few days, 334 trains will move 69,000 men, 21,000 horses along with guns and supplies to Southampton to embark for France. At the same time, a thousand lorries and 300 buses are requisitioned to carry the British soldiers from the French ports to the front. Many more will march on foot with their kit on their backs. 
when he went to France, the soldier of the British Expeditionary Force was wearing this, a set of 1908 pattern equipments. What we've got is a small pack, mess tins on the outside here, personal kit in the ground sheet in here. Two pints of water in the water bottle, and on this side, we've actually got the bayonet and the handle to the entrenching tool. The head to the entrenching tool is here. And around the front, we've got pouches on each side. What we've got there, five rounds from that pouch. Each one of those pouches, 10 of them all together, takes 15. It means there's 150 bullets easily available for any soldier in the BEF. This equipment here weighs something like 57 pounds minimum. And in 1914, the minimum weight of a soldier was 112 pounds. With this on at 57 pounds, it's actually more than half his body weight. Going into battle in 1916 with gas masks, steel helmet, grenades, it's probably about 66 pounds. By late August, just 84,000 men of the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, have landed in France. The British Army was a very small body. It was essentially a colonial police force that would be sent to police the empire, protect it from external threats, and put down internal rebellions. It was not intended for a major war. Incredibly, the British Army in Europe is smaller even than the 117,000 strong Belgian army. When thrown into a maelstrom of a massive European conflict, it was undergunned and undersupplied. And it's about to face the might of the best equipped and best prepared army in the world. The 600,000 German soldiers marching into Belgium. Majesty. I hear you're after my crown. Me casa su casa. <laughs> oh, man, got my bingo in me blood. That's it. The size of the thing. Blue. Got me royal band. <laughs> got me royal corgi. <laughs> and me royal merchandise. <laughs> I'll boot you a nice long cruise. I think that's a yes. <laughs> Come on, world. Jackpot join us and grab fun by the balls. Curry's PC Well, we've got great deals on Hot Point washers and Hoover dryers. This Hot Point Smart Plus shifts 40 common stains in just 45 minutes, now only 329. And this Hoover condenser dryer has a water tank in the door, making it simple to view at just 299. At Curry's PC Wells, we help you get it right. When guys shave, this is what they do to try to get every hair. This is what we do. Shaving rebuilds with Gillette Flexball technology. Moves like no other razor. It responds to the contours of your face. Gillette. There is no camera, there is no evidence, there is no sag. You can't see it. No, I heard it. You heard what? 26,000 omdrejninger and bevisst acceleration. I mean, Vine Turbo, that's what you don't find out. You said you didn't see the car. That did not happen. I could have looked at him and got a new outstanding system with a catalyzator. Did you mean this? No, precisely that. At Essay, we're obsessed with details. Our new Synergy Supreme Plus unleaded fuel reduces friction to help look after your engine. Essay, energy lives here. Cold, too cold. I decide to make a clean break and run away to sea. At least until sometime next week. Seven night holidays departing Southampton from 899 per person. Now with 200 pounds per cabin to spend on board. P&O Cruises. This is the life. Yeah, going for the goal, no. Yeah. 
PS4 for the players. Well, this is unexpected. Too right. I just got a £10 welcome bonus from Betway's Live Casino. It can't be. I know. So many tables to choose from. Live blackjack and, oh, live roulette. Please, hurry! OK, OK. All on red, please. It's too close! Nah, still spinning. Where will it stop? <laughs> Nobody knows. Oh, but... The love of the game. Betway. So, Dad, this is it? This is the one? I'm moving in. Oh, great. So, do you need help sorting all the moving in that? Oh, no, it's, it's OK, Dad. I can do all that on Zoopla. Oh. OK, removals. Tick. Energy and broadband. Sorted. Oh, well, if you're all sorted... Th oh, no, here comes your Uncle Phil. Pretend we haven't seen him. Praise the waves! Oh. Huh? Hiya, Phil. Praise the waves! Yeah, praise the waves. He really loves those waves, doesn't he? Sort your property move on Zoopla. Praise the waves! The German army was undoubtedly the greatest army in Europe in 1914. A massive displacement of people caused absolute terror. This kind of warfare is a descent into inhumanity that the world hasn't seen before. The unprecedented numbers behind one catastrophic war. People were struggling to survive. The UK premiere of The Great War in Numbers continues Wednesday at 9 on Yesterday or catch up with UK TV Play. August 1914. Europe's old imperial elite is at war. A new kind of war which they do not understand and which will lead to their ruin. 600,000 German troops under Prussian General Helmut von Moltke are tearing through neutral Belgium. The Germans need to get to France before the French forces have a chance to organise themselves. The trouble is, Belgium is defended by a ring of defensive forts and it's holding them up. Belgium's forts put up an unexpectedly strong resistance and massively slowed the German advance. Von Moltke now has no choice but to bring up the heavy guns. The Germans now unveil the first industrial superweapon of World War I. Nicknamed Big Bertha, this 42 centimetre calibre howitzer gun fires an 800 kilogram shell almost 10 kilometres, well beyond the range of the Belgian artillery. In a matter of hours, the Germans have destroyed Belgium's great forts. In just one single day, the German artillery overturned three centuries of military doctrine that relies on defensive forts. This is a totally new type of war. But the defiance of ordinary Belgians leads to brutal German reprisals. Six and a half thousand civilians are killed. Thousands more are taken hostage. Almost one and a half million flee their homes. The historic university town of Louvain is looted and set on fire. Portrayed in the press as the rape of Belgium, it provokes outrage in Britain and America. There was a massive propaganda campaign that ran in the newspapers following what was referred to as the, the rape of Belgium. Anything that the Germans did was magnified tremendously. So you started out with a report that the Germans had rung the Antwerp church bells after capturing the city, and by the time the press had done with it, they had hung priests upside down from the church bells and used them as human clappers. Prussian military brutality is not new. What is new are the means of mass communication by which news of it quickly spreads. It was an enormous propaganda own goal for Germany, and one that Britain would never allow it to forget. Thousands of outraged British people answer the call for volunteers. 33,000 enlist on just one day in September. By the end of that month, the number of volunteers has reached a colossal 760,000. It 
will be months before Britain's new volunteer army is trained and ready. But they, like the Germans and French, will be trained and equipped for a form of war which no longer exists, though they don't yet know it. On the outbreak of war, British soldiers were wearing something like this. It's basically a cap, uh, stiffened with a piece of wire, has absolutely no ballistic quality whatsoever. Bullet shrapnel goes straight through it. German army, slightly better off. They've got this, the pickle halb, with a, a cover over it when it was in use. It might stop a, a shrapnel ball at long range, might actually turn a, a blow with a, a musket butt or something, but that was all. Something better was needed, particularly because the men were in trenches and it was their heads that was the most vulnerable in a trench. So by September 1915, British Army start to get this, called the Brodie after its inventor, basically manganese steel designed to deflect bits of shrapnel, fragments of shell, debris falling out the sky. Sadly, by the way, a bullet will go straight through it. Having overtaken Belgium, a tide of German soldiers move into northern France, slaughtering the British and French in terrifying numbers. The French suffer 140,000 casualties in just four days, caused in part by outdated French methods of fighting. The French were wedded to a tactical doctrine known as the offensive at all costs. This was a doctrine that argued that the best way to defeat the Germans was to attack them in large numbers with the spirit of France, the fury France are. Unfortunately, this resulted in them advancing into artillery, rifle and machine gun fire and dying in catastrophic numbers. French losses in August of 1914 were absolutely horrendous. They, they lost 27,000 men, for example, in one single day. And if the losses were to continue at that rate, then every man in France would be dead by 1917. For the next two weeks, the British and French are forced on the run to avoid being encircled by the rapidly advancing German armies. The retreat was harrowing for all involved. They traveled huge distances on foot. Men had to be dragged along, picked up on supply wagons. Units became mixed, they were outrunning their lines of communication, so they were struggling to feed people. It looks like the Germans will succeed. France will fall, and the war will be over by Christmas. But just as railways allowed the Germans to strike France with industrial speed and efficiency, they now do the same in the east as Russia attacks Germany. On the 15th of August, 1914, two Russian armies of 485,000 men invade Eastern Germany. The initial German response to a Russian invasion of East Prussia was actually to fall back away from it, to try and delay the Russian invasion for as long as possible without fighting a major battle. Russian trains bring their armies to the German border at great speed but now they hit a glitch. Russian railways use a different gauge track to Germany, so the invading troops have to disembark at the border and advance on foot. Without trains to bring up supplies, the advancing Russian armies pillage the countryside, rounding up and killing over a 1,000 German civilians. The trauma of the Russian invasion will haunt Germany for decades a massive displacement of people caused by the Russian invasion then really leads to absolute terror. I mean, it's possible at one point that Berlin might fall. And it's very arguable, actually, Hitler's view towards Russia is shaped very much by those events of early 1914 and the beginning of the war. In the East, Germany is massively outnumbered. 173,000 German soldiers face 485,000 Russians, advancing in two columns. But the Russian army is greatly inferior. It was a large, slow-moving army, reliant on an antiquated supply network, and above all else, it was being commanded by two quarrelling generals. 
Samsonov and Renenkampf hated one another and were not on speaking terms, and Russian communications were antiquated, reliant almost entirely on horse-borne messenger or radio traffic broadcast without any encryption whatsoever. The Germans learn from intercepted radio transmissions that the two Russian armies have become separated. They're transmitting radio broadcasts uh, en clair uh, in uncoded messaging which the Germans can anticipate. The Germans manage to corner 230,000 Russian troops in the south and move in for the kill. The Russians now in danger of being cut off. They try to withdraw at the last minute, but it's too late. An entire Russian offensive at that point is broken. Germany has managed to save itself. The numbers, again, are shocking. 78,000 Russians are killed or wounded, 92,000 captured. The German casualties are less than one-tenth of that. Never again in the First World War would an army be encircled and destroyed quite as comprehensively as the Russians were at Tannenberg. The Russians humiliated in the east, British and French forces decimated in the west, the Germans moving on Paris. The war, it seems, will soon be over. But now it's the turn of the French to deploy their railway network as a weapon of war. Commander Joseph Joffre orders trains to bring men from all over France. They deliver 150,000 Frenchmen, a new army assembled by the River Marne just outside Paris. And the Germans don't even know it's there. The so-called Miracle of the Marne begins on the 5th of September, 1914. This was the moment when Joffre threw his great counterattack at the Battle of the Marne into action. It was the moment when the war began to turn against the Germans. When the French need even more troops, they hire 630 Parisian taxis to carry 5,000 reinforcements from Paris to the front. The taxi drivers are even allowed to keep their meters running and the French government pays the 70,000 franc fare. The French determination to drive the Germans back from Paris is captured in one general's message in the heat of battle. My centre is giving way. My right is in retreat. Situation excellent. I attack. It's known as the miracle on the Marne because it seems so unlikely that British and French forces were able to stop this German juggernaut or indeed compel it to withdraw. But the French attack, supported by the British, stuns the Germans. The French counterattack was especially effective because of timing. The Germans had overreached themselves. The army had been fighting and marching for weeks and it was exhausted and it was struck at a time when it was at its very lowest ebb. The casualties on both sides are horrific. The Germans lose 105,000 men. The French and British, 85,000. More men are killed and injured in this one single battle than were fielded at Waterloo. The Germans withdraw to the north. The Allies are forced to follow. The battered remnants of the British Expeditionary Force finds itself taking up defensive positions around the Belgian town of Ypres. Soon they will find themselves facing an overwhelming force of German soldiers. But this time they are ready. This time they are dug in. What happens at Ypres will go down in history a tragedy the like of which has never been seen, and it will set the pattern for this senseless, bloody, industrial war. Yesterday profiles the tortured genius who single-mindedly steered the course of war from Bletchley Park. Meet Alan Turing, codebreaker, in just a moment. <laughs> 